free lives by abusive pastors. Base runs counter to the message of Christ. It is totally incompatible with Jesus' way of life. Anyone who acts in abusive behavior out of malice immediately transgresses their ministry. There is no place for discussion or dispute. There is no leeway. This is true. Unfortunately, we are all too aware that abuse happens in churches. The weak members of their community are severely wounded by the persons we go to for spiritual healing and direction. A pastor being removed from their position of authority due to accusations of sexual misconduct, financial theft, or emotional and physical abuse seems to happen far too frequently. Abuse in the church frequently involves a recurring pattern of conduct. Such behavior is frequently acknowledged but rationalized away. Pastors that are abusive and toxic often disguise their actions with religious terminology. Scripture is misinterpreted and taken out of context in order to support the leader's wrong behavior. Sadly, these defenses sometimes come off as being overly convincing. This video includes some of the words and phrases frequently used to hide abuse. Recognizing the lies that abusive pastors say is the first step in combating abuse in the church. Scripture never excuses wrongdoing, and abuse is never justified. This is heavenly discipline, says one. Pastors who are abusive frequently make an effort to justify their remarks or actions using vocabulary related to discipline. Because the leader is merely carrying out their official leadership duties, the disciplinary justification is used as justification for unrestrained behavior. The pastor's definition of discipline permits verbal assaults and insults, sometimes from the pulpit and frequently in private. Any verbal abuse committed by a church leader constitutes abuse rather than discipline. The discipline mentioned in the Bible has to do with letting one's actions have their natural repercussions in one's life. Say, for instance, that a church prohibits intoxication among worship leaders. Any leader who disregards this guideline will be held accountable. He or she can possibly be kicked out of the ministry. This is control. The healthy approach to live in a community is to hold people accountable for their deeds. Every group or organization has procedures for dealing with actions or conduct that endanger the group or its members. This is effective leadership behavior. Yes, it is necessary to deal with disruptive behavior inside the church. However, the application of discipline by genuine Christian leaders is always done with love and grace. There is a willing desire to walk with the other, to mend fences, and to take pleasure in community. There is no place for anger or condemnation in discipline. However, God's righteous discipline is not the same as church discipline. Hebrews 12 4-10 refers to the Lord's discipline as our natural battle against life's challenges. It's important to note that this discipline of the Lord is imparted by the Lord and is not a tool used by the human leaders. God occasionally places us in challenging situations that test our faith. This promotes our spiritual development. In other words, God's benevolent presence is the foundation of the Lord's discipline. As we go through the period of discipline, the Lord travels with us. There are no lightning bolts being thrown out of the sky during the Lord's punishment. The God of lightning and smiting is one that is more associated with Greek mythology than with the Bible. God pardons. God is a healer. God doesn't punish anyone by derision, insult, or in front of the public. Physical punishment is never a part of God's discipline. A leader is verbally and emotionally abusing someone when they repeatedly make fun of a staff member or publicly humiliate a member of the church. A leader is not exercising discipline when they hit someone or behave in a physically violent manner. This must change. Pastors who are abusive and brutal and crazy to tell the truth and love and godly discipline in Ephesians 4 5. However, being a leader does not give one the authority to verbally insult their followers. No congregations have not been given to the pastors. They should become accusers of their congregations before God and their fellow human beings. Dietrich Bonhoeffer once stated in a piece. The clergy should never make anyone feel threatened. Nobody should ever be afraid of stepping out of line for fear of getting angry texts, raving emails, or the proverbial tongue lashing from the boss. All of these characteristics point to the pastors possessing an abusive spirit, which is intolerable in the Church of Christ. It's a private matter. In the Church, there are just too many instances of sexual abuse. A leader and a minor may occasionally mistreat one another. It can occasionally happen between two adults. It is inappropriate for a pastor to date a member of the congregation. This is due to the fact that power and dominance frequently take precedence over love and respect in romantic relationships. Let's face it, even when it involves two willing adults, having an extramarital affair is never acceptable. The seventh and tenth commandments are directly in conflict with having an affair. Anyone in a position of leadership in the church who maintains a romantic relationship with someone other than their spouse does not represent Christian holiness.
Additionally, whatever justifications they offer for the affair are deceptive lies intended to enhance their reputation. But what takes place when a pastor is single? They should be allowed to pursue romantic relationships, right? Why should the congregation be concerned about the pastor's personal life? These issues frequently arise as justifications for approving sexual relationships in the church. There are discussions and decisions that may be taken to make sure a romantic attachment between an unmarried pastor and a member of the congregation grows in a healthy way. Transparency and openness are essential. In certain situations, the pastor should tell a denominational leader or a church elder about the relationship. This is for both their own safety and well-being as well as the safety and well-being of the church member. After all, being a pastor or priest involves serving the people. Week after week, the leader occupies a position of authority and influence before the congregation. This implies that the pastor's life must involve some degree of transparency in all respects. Yes, this does include who the person is dating and the seriousness of the connection. However, abusive leaders keep their love lives under wraps. If it is discovered, the situation is immediately deemed private, no discussion is permitted. The church community, as well as the person in the relationship, should be alerted by the pastor's refusal to acknowledge a romantic relationship. Any secretiveness in a romantic connection indicates a power differential, and this power differential fundamentally undermines the health of the partnership. Furthermore, over the years, abusive pastors frequently have several sexual relationships inside a congregation. Contrary to what they may claim, abusive church leaders don't fall in love with their flock. They employ them. The sexual connection is solely unilateral. It just serves the ego and desires of the pastor. In the end, the congregation member feels betrayed and hurt, and many decide to completely leave the church. Check out the fruit. 3. An argument for abusive behavior is also frequently made by referencing the ministry's success or the church's growth. The abusive leader uses the community's efforts to justify their leadership or behavior, regardless of whether the group is numerically expanding or actively involved in outreach or evangelism. However, this falsehood implies that abusive behavior is required in order for God to reward the church. Unspoken belief is that conflict or abusive behavior should be disregarded. The communities that go down the path of emotional, spiritual, sexual, or physical abuse ever experience God's blessings? Do we adore and serve that God? Is ever using violence the answer? Despite the argument that ministry is beneficial, there is never a good reason to hurt someone else. This pathetic justification for abusive behavior is some sort of equivalent to saying that Mussolini's tyranny was acceptable because he made the trains run on schedule. It is logical absurdity done in the most serious way. It is not appropriate to trade someone's trauma, emotional suffering, or spiritual suffering in order to further the leader's ministry or popularity. So believing implies that members of the church can be exploited and used without repercussions. No pastor, minister, elder, or deacon has the right to exploit another, regardless of how successful a ministry is. No one should be abused by religious leaders, not even the most successful ones. Conclusion People who have a suspicion that something is amiss are frequently present whenever abuse occurs within the church. In fact, this is the very reason the aforementioned proverbs are used. The leader responds by explaining why the actions are misinterpreted, such as it's a private matter, it's God's punishment, or just look at the fruit, when someone starts to question the leader's behavior or actions. We tend to take such assertions at face value since we love our leaders and respect them. Yet everything is a veil. It is untrue. Abuse cannot be justified. No matter how big or little, every member of a church community is expected to contribute to the upkeep and defense of the group. This means that you must talk to someone immediately if you believe that your community's leader is abusing his or her power. Speak to the denominational leader if there is one you can. Inquire about a private meeting with the elected representatives, the parish council, or the board of elders. Speaking your mind is never incorrect, especially if you believe that someone is being physically, emotionally, or spiritually abused. This concern and care for the congregation is welcomed by genuine Christian leaders.